My name is Esther Kane, AFTD's Director of Support and Education. First, I'd like to thank Parker for sharing her story with us. We hope you listen to her on Spotify and Apple Music and download her songs. Now for our next session, we will be ta talking about the uncertainty families face as they confront the fact that as Susan shared earlier, while most FTD is sporadic, some FTD is inherited in families. For many in this room, questions around FTD genetics may be very personal and sensitive. It, is an, it can be an even harder topic to confront alone. Fortunately, we have Lainey Drack, a certified genetic counselor from the University of Pennsylvania's FTD Center, to guide us through this subject. She is an expert in helping families navigate questions surrounding genetics and inherited disease. And she's the co-founder of the annual Penn Familial FTD ALS Conference. We're very glad to have her with us today to share her expertise. Lainey, welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Lainey Dratch. I'm a genetic counselor at the University of Pennsylvania's Penn FTD Center. And I'm really honored to be here today to speak with you about navigating the uncertainty of familial FTD. And a big thank you up front to the IFTD for recognizing this topic as so important to the community, which I really think it is. Um, so to start off, I just want to paint a picture of what the central theme is going to be for this presentation, which is the journey. Uh, so you'll notice that this path is a windy one and it's not the same distance from each point to on the path and uh, there's, there's no, that direction you can go. The road can go in many different directions here. So the path through FTD that we'll talk through from start to finish here is going to be a messy one um, and it's going to look different for everybody. So as I talk through the different experiences that um, tend to have popped up commonly in the families I've counseled, it's okay if it doesn't align perfectly with yours. This is meant to be um, a, an exploration of some of the things that people can experience, but no two journeys look the same. So often at the beginning of the journey, it starts with something seems different. And it's usually not the person uh, with a diagnosis, it's not the person with FTD who's the one noticing that in themselves. And that's because lack of insight is a symptom of uh, some of the common forms of FTD, and it can make it really hard for them to realize something is wrong. So this means that the loved ones around this person, whether that's family members, friends, coworkers, whoever it may be, are often the ones who have to observe something is different or off and speak up about it. And it can be really hard for people to bring this up because it can be uncomfortable and people cannot really be sure, you know, what exactly is going on. And so often it's up to the people around the person with the diagnosis to advocate um, and, and get connected to resources. And so because of this, many people with FTD can go um, through years and years of evaluations um, and years of, of things not seeming right before they get to the right diagnosis. You know, the symptoms of FTD can look different in different people, and they're not what we think of when we think of a dementia in adulthood, as you've heard throughout presentations today. And so it can take a really long time to even just get to the right provider. You can bounce around between psychiatrists, psychiatrists, psychologists, primary care doctors, neurologists who might not be quite specialized enough to make the diagnosis of FTD, because it can be a really tricky diagnosis to make. And so this ends up resulting in what we call a diagnostic odyssey. It's a long journey even just to get to the diagnosis. And so one of the main goals of advocacy effort, efforts of, thing, of places like the AFTD is to raise awareness that FTD is a diagnosis that's out there um, so we can try to get earlier diagnoses and avoid this odyssey. And what I'll, part of what I'll focus on today is how genetics can be part of shortening this diagnostic odyssey and helping people come to an understanding. So after we got through the something seems different phase, eventually people end up with that diagnosis. And that answers the question of the what. But that doesn't stop there, right? There's a lot of emotional reactions that can come with this diagnosis. It can feel like, finally, we know what's going on and give you a sense of relief. But it can also come with stress because of the uncertainty that lies ahead. Um, it can come with frustration at the world that your family is in this position. It can come with anger. 
uh, it can come with profound sadness because this is a loss that can be grieved. This is a loss of an expected future and perhaps of hope you might've been holding out that something actually wasn't wrong and maybe you were just reading into things. Um, but at the same time, you know, along with this fear, this stress, this anger, um, can also sometimes come a sense of community because we know what the diagnosis is and we can access resources related to it, like the conferences like you're at today. It can also come with a sense of control and being able to plan, figuring out, you know, what you can do for them moving forward and a sense of understanding. You know, it can be really hard when people have changes in their behavior, their personality, their language to not, um, you know, to not know why. And so it can give a sense of understanding and um, it's okay to, to then um, feel that relief that, you know, this, the behaviors or the things they were doing wasn't them, it was the disease. Um, and you have to forgive yourself for ways you might have reacted to past uh, behaviors before you might've known what's going on. So it can be a really um, tough time to get the diagnosis, but then the journey continues. So you have this diagnosis. Now what? Uh, you know, it can be really uh, frightening to think about the future because there's just so many questions about what does this future hold. So it's really important to ask the neurologist the questions you have about the potential disease course, but understanding that nobody's going to be able to predict the exact future for any one person. Um, so you have to put yourself in a position to get the answers you can get, but to be able to cope with the remaining uncertainty as well. You will have practical, logistical, legal insurance questions that will pop up over time. And so it's important to see if there's a social worker that you can connect with, either through the neurology clinic or through other resources. And sometimes it's also helpful to seek legal aid for things like durable power of attorney, if that's something that you're considering. Uh, it's also important to tap into the community and other support systems, things like the AFTD and the support groups that they run. Um, sometimes there's private groups through social media that can be useful. Uh, but I always caution, you know, take this one step at a time. It can be really easy to go down the rabbit hole and deep dive into all these resources and see people posting about things that can feel really scary. And so you need to pace yourself. Sometimes people find it helpful to set a time limit. You know, I'm going to only spend 15 minutes today looking through this website and then I'm going to cut myself off so I can focus on other things. You have to do what's best for you. And after you get the diagnosis, that's when it might come up uh, to consider getting a genetic evaluation with a genetic counselor. And so the next step on that journey really follows from that, which is once we have this diagnosis, many people wonder why, you know, why is this happening to my loved one, to me, to my family? And um, this is often when people get referred to genetic counseling. So that's when I often come into the picture. And so what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time talking about some of the key concepts that you would go over in a genetic counseling visit, but this is not meant to be a comprehensive genetic counseling appointment. If you have follow-up questions, you should absolutely ask for an appointment with a genetic counselor. Many people start by asking what causes FTD? Uh, you know, from the pathologic sense, it's the abnormal accumulation of protein in the brain that causes the neurons or brain cells to die. And that's what leads to the shrinkage or atrophy of the brain. But what causes that in itself can be really hard to answer. Most people with FTD have what we call multifactorial inheritance, where it's not one specific thing that has caused FTD, but rather a combination of factors over time that contributed to risk. That can be things like trauma to the brain, exposures, it can be teeny tiny genetic risk factors, we're not even smart enough to know how to test for yet. Um, and so it can be a combination of risk that over time causes disease. Most people don't have a single genetic cause of their FTD, but some people do. And we'll talk a little bit about when that's more common and um, you know, how we can sort of answer that question for people. So this sort of leads into the, one of the main questions that people come in asking, which is, is this FTD sporadic or familial? And so I wanna spend a little bit of time explaining some of the nuance here. So familial usually refers to somebody has FTD and they have a family history of at least one other person who's developed FTD or a related condition. About 40% of people with FTD fall into that bucket. So if you look at the diagram on the screen here, the people who are shown in blue would be that 40% of people who have some sort of family history of FTD or related diagnoses. Among those people, 
it's more likely that we find a genetic cause. So when there's a stronger family history, the chances of finding a genetic cause are higher. And so sometimes people will interchange the terms familial and genetic, even though they mean slightly different things, because sometimes you can have a family history of FTD, but we haven't quite figured out the genetic reason why yet. The term sporadic I have in quotes here because I actually prefer to say apparent sporadic because sporadic is usually referred to as um, somebody with FTD who has no family history of FTD related conditions. But there's limitations to family history. You know, sometimes um, people can go on to have a relative to develop FTD later in life, even though they were the first one to develop FTD. And so sporadic is a little bit of a tricky term. And some people also use sporadic to mean not genetic. What, and that's a little bit challenging as well because you could be the only person in the family to have FTD. So you could fall into those gray icons on the screen, but still have a genetic cause. About five to 10% of people who don't have family history of FTD will still have a genetic reason for why. So some people try to figure out, well, how can we differentiate between sporadic and familial FTD? The symptoms don't really help us differentiate that because they can be overlapping and similar. Sometimes there's findings on an autopsy that can help point to this being likely to be genetic or familial, but many autopsy findings can be seen in, in both types. And not all autopsies include the right analyses to even be able to check for those hints that it can be genetic. And so family history can help guide us. As we were saying, the distinction is often, is there another family member who's had disease or not? But there can be people who have died young of other causes and would have maybe gone on to develop FTD, so the family history looks negative, or people can not ever make it to the right doctor. We talked about how hard it is to get the right diagnosis. People might not communicate that information to the family, even if there was a diagnosis. You know, historically, there was some stigma associated with some of the symptoms that can happen with FTD that, you know, the world has gotten a lot better, but in the past, the, you know, sometimes people were sent to an institution and this diagnosis was never communicated. So family history is a start, but it's a limited tool. I'd like to take a step back for a second and uh, do a little bit of a deeper dive into what we're talking about when we say genes. So genes are what we call, uh, in, in genetic counseling speak, the instruction manual of the body. The genes are sort of like the code to the body. It tells it how to grow and develop. And if something is wrong with the genes, it can cause disease. And so we like to think of it as sort of like this spelled out letter code of instructions. And so, for example, if the body was told to make the hip and the leg, but there was a one letter difference in that DNA code where the L changes to a P, and now tells the body the hip and the peg, and that's a very different outcome. And so in FTD and other neurologic diseases, a single letter difference like this can sometimes be enough to cause disease, and there are other types of genetic differences as well. But this is the, the most basic example here. And so I've been hinting at FTD and overlapping conditions. Sometimes, um, you know, we, within FTD, we talk about different flavors, right? There's the behavioral variant, there's the language variant, but FTD is also considered to be on a spectrum of neuro neurologic disease. There's a very strong overlap between FTD and ALS or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also called Lou Gehrig's disease. There's also overlap sometimes with symptoms and the genetic underpinnings with Alzheimer's disease. And there can be overlap with atypical Parkinsonism conditions like cortical basal sy syndrome or uh, progressive supranuclear palsy. And so sometimes uh, there can be people who develop symptoms of multiple conditions or there can be multiple conditions popping up in the same family. The importance of a, of a true neurologic diagnosis here is that there are slightly different genes that can cause some of these conditions. And so it's important for the genetic counselor to know um, what the diagnosis is so that we know what genes to evaluate. Often when you think about um, FTD genetics, uh, you'll see refer refer uh, references to uh, the big three, as I like to call them, which are the C9RF72 gene, the GRN gene, and the MAPT gene. Sometimes GRN is called progranulin, and sometimes you hear MAPT called tau or map tau. The C9ORF72 gene, which I call C9 for short, uh, is the actually the most common genetic cause of FTD and also happens to be the most common genetic cause of ALS. This is also the one where if there's no family history, it's more likely if there's a genetic cause, it's going to be in the C9 gene. Uh, the MAPT and GRN genes are also quite common in terms of genetic causes of FTD. 
um, and some features are listed on the screen here. Um, and there are many other genes besides these three that we know can cause FTD and sometimes also with overlap of ALS and other conditions. So it's important if you do end up going to a genetic counselor to ask about what types of genes are going to be covered on whatever testing you have. Most of the genes that cause FTD are inherited in what we call an autosomal dominant pattern. Autosomal means that it, men and women can be impacted equally. The dominant piece means that only one copy of the gene needs to not be working the way it's supposed to in order to cause disease. And so we got two copies of almost every gene, one from mom and one from dad. And so if one copy is not working, it can cause disease. The other piece to this is if a parent has the disease and it's due to an autosomal dominant genetic form, every time they have a child, there's a 50% or one in two chance of passing down that genetic difference to each child that they have. So what is genetic counseling? You know, we've talked a little bit about the genetics and the genetic testing here, but what is genetic counseling and who should think about it? Uh, so genetic counseling is really a process. It's the process of helping people to understand and adapt to the medical, psychological, and familial implications of the genetic disease. And so in order to do this, we take a family medical history and use that to inform our risk assessment. We help educate about um, you know, the different inheritance patterns, the types of testing, things you might be able to do for management, prevention, resources, research, all of these things that go into the full spectrum of care. And as the name suggests, genetic counseling involves counseling to help people make the decisions that are right for them. So in genetic counseling, it's usually there's no right or wrong answer. It's whatever is best for you and for the family. If I can emphasize anything here, it's that genetic counseling is not the same as genetic testing. You can absolutely have a genetic counseling visit even if you know that you don't wanna have any testing done. You can have a genetic counseling visit even if testing has already been completed. The point of genetic counseling is really just to answer your questions and get you the care you need. So what follows from that is basically anybody who has questions should have a genetic counseling appointment. Regardless of whether you want testing, genetic counseling can be a value to answer questions, help you get resources and help with coping. Um, and just one more time, genetic counseling does not always mean genetic testing. There are two main types of genetic testing. Diagnostic genetic testing refers to a person already has a neurologic diagnosis, so in this case, FTD, and we're looking to see with genetics to figure out why they developed this diagnosis. So it's a person who already has symptoms trying to figure out why. Predictive genetic testing, on the other hand, is somebody who is a unaffected person, so they don't have any symptoms, and they're looking to see if they might be at risk for symptoms in the future. So for example, if um, you know a parent has a genetic form of FTD and a child wants to see if they might be at risk to develop it someday. Both of these types of genetic testing are available clinically, and sometimes uh, through certain studies, they can be available through research. And it's really important to talk with a genetic counselor to figure out um, you know, which route you wanna go uh, because they have some unique differences, although that's not the focus of today's talk. So some people say, you know, I already have this diagnosis of FTD or my loved one already has this diagnosis of FTD. What the heck is the point of another test? You know, what information is this gonna get me? What is the purpose of asking why this developed? And so for people, it can really vary of which reasons resonate with them. But some of the common ones are, you know, alleviating guilt. Uh, you know, some people tend to really blame themselves for things they did or didn't do in their lifetime that could have caused disease. Finding out that a genetic cause was the culprit from the time you were born can help people, you know, uh, feel less guilty about actions they may or may not have taken. It can be a sense of relief to just know, you know, why this has happened. For some people, it can help avoid um, additional tests that cost money and time and further this diagnostic odyssey. It can help anticipate future medical needs. You know, we talked about there's overlap between some of the conditions. Um, so some of the genes we could say, okay, this explains why you've developed FTD and it's possible there might be risk for ILS in the future. And that can help anticipate some medical and, and also practical logistical needs. Um, another uh, sort of area here is reproductive uh, considerations. So either for the person diagnosed or for their loved ones who might be at risk, it can help people decide you know, how they might want to go about having children. You know, do they want to use alternative reproductive methods to avoid passing down a mutation? Do they want to have kids? Are there things they might consider doing differently? 
And one of the really big things that um, has come about in recent years is this idea of the potential to treat. So there's been a lot of hope and a lot of advancement in the genetic focused clinical trials. And so although there's not anything FDA approved for um, you know, a, a therapeutic right now, there's a lot of hope in the ongoing research studies. So a genetic diagnosis could be a step towards a research study and or future treatment. From the predictive testing side, it's a little different. Remember, these are people who don't have diagnoses, but they're looking to figure out why. And so there's a lot of different things that people can consider in terms of whether or not they wanna know their status. And it's a highly personal choice and nobody should ever be told they have to get predictive testing. The, um, the, some of the main things that come up are people thinking about future planning. So do I wanna change my reproductive planning? Do I want to think about my career, about retirement, about you know, um, where I want to live. Uh, is this information going to make me really anxious on a day-to-day -day basis? Is it going to do anything beneficial for me or not? Um, and the, one of the key considerations I'll point out with predictive testing is there's some privacy concerns that you need to think about ahead of time. Um, there are laws in place that protect you against uh, discrimination from your health insurance and your employer in most situations, but there are loopholes for things like life insurance, long-term care insurance, and disability insurance that you should consider thinking about what policies you have before you have testing done. And a genetic counselor can walk you through that in more detail. Sometimes a genetic diagnosis in a family can feel like you're starting a whole new journey and it can really be a roller coaster. It's an answer to why and that can bring relief and understanding, sense of control and planning. But it can also bring all of these feelings of like more anger, like why is this in our family? Feeling just unfair, again, grieving this. And then also having to then communicate this to at-risk family members can come with fear, stress, but also then a sense of control and people can use it, uh, or use it or not use it however they want. And so, uh, you know, this can feel like a, a little bit of whiplash and uh, it can be a whole nother journey within itself. And that's why genetic counseling is so important to help you through this. And so now I'll go back to our main journey here that we've talked about from the start. And uh, many people think of this end goal as sort of adjusting and coping. But if you'll remember from the start, you know, it's not a clear path. There's no end destination. This adaptation, coping, adjusting is sort of like being stuck in a roundabout here because life goes on and you will get new challenges. You will get new journeys as, as this time progresses and as the symptoms change and as your life situation changes. And so it's not an end of the road. It's not a final accomplishment, but it is a process. And what I'd like to point out is that you're probably adjusting and coping before you're even realizing it. You are resilient to get through day to day. And sometimes it can help to focus on um, being really intentional about, uh, intentional about how you are adjusting and coping and adapting to help further your process. So here are some really tangible ways that you can uh, process your emotional reactions. So allow yourself to grieve the loss. Give yourself the time and space. It is okay to feel disappointment, frustration, devastation, shock, you name it, um, for the loved one and for yourself and for your family. Uh, it can be really, really hard to process this and not everyone will understand what you're going through. So allow yourself the space to do that. You should be cautious of soft blame. You know, it's really easy as humans to try to blame ourselves. We always feel like, you know, oh, if only I did this or if I didn't do that. Um, so make sure you try to avoid those, um, those sort of self-blame statements, even though it can be hard. The other thing is it's okay and normal to feel relief, to know that, you know, the diagnosis and the symptoms, it's not their fault. Um, to know that, you know, we have a little bit of an action plan for what we can do. And, you know, sometimes people tell me they feel really bad that they almost hoped it was genetic because maybe it could mean treatment because then they know that means their family's at risk. And that can be a really hard thing to weigh. You know, it's not, you don't have to feel bad about these things. The, the nature of it is that there's going to be pros and cons to every, every aspect of this. And so it's really important to just um, put yourself in the best situation to cope with these ambiguous and uncertain situations. To acknowledge that, you know, there are losses here in terms of what you planned for the future, what you expected your future to look like will be different. Who you identify as, you know, people go from uh, being the spouse or the child or the friend to being 
a care partner in addition to those things. And it can be really hard to adjust those roles. It can feel like a loss of opportunity for things that, you know, you might have expected to do as a family or in your career or in other things that might change as a result of the diagnosis impacting the whole family. And the hardest part can be that sometimes others don't really understand. We often talk about um, this idea of ambiguous loss when it comes to FTD, where the person is physically in front of you, but psychologically, they're not the same person they once were. Often it changes the way you relate to them because of the way the symptoms can affect their behavior, their um, speech, their personality. And so even though they are still your loved one, they might not behave the same way or feel the same way your loved one did. And so that's different from a death, for example, where that's a really concrete loss that people understand as a loss and know how to grieve and know how to support you through. This is a loss that people often don't understand. And so um, you should um, you know, still acknowledge to yourself what you're going through and draw on the coping skills you've already developed throughout this diagnostic odyssey and process to get you through. I highly encourage you to check out um, the ambiguousloss.com website developed by Pauline Voss, who's the one who developed the term ambiguous loss. It talks about ways you can um, cope with ambiguous loss. Uh, and so this the sort of six steps outlined here are not meant to be linear by any means, but these are ways that you can um, adjust to this new normal. So making sense of the, of the problem and figuring out a way to find meaning in the situation. Um, figuring out what you can control and what you can't, knowing who you are and redefining family boundaries, um, managing the anxiety from the emotions that will come up, uh, letting go of some of the certainty of the loss and um, uh, of the, cer the certainty that's missing from the loss and acknowledging that the person is both sort of here and not in some way and figure out how you're going to relate to them and find new hope, find new ways to um, hope for the future despite this uncertainty and this loss. And so this is just a, another reminder that, again, this coping is not linear. And, um, you know, it can change day to day, minute to minute, month to month, year to year. It's okay to have the ups and downs because nobody is perfect and nobody is expecting anyone to be, um, you know, adjusted. This is a process, as we said. I'd like to highlight some strategies for hope that others have shared have been helpful to them. Um, and so one of them I'll highlight here is talking to others in conferences, forums, support groups, and just want to give everyone here a little, you know, pat on the back because you're already doing that. So you already are doing things that can help you. Um, but here are some others listed on the screen that, that some people have found helpful. And what I'll really encourage you to do is be really intentional and think about how do you find and maintain hope? How are you going to help yourself cope and get through this and, um, and look to the future and uh, be able to, to do so in a way that's meaningful for you and for your family. And that can look really different from person to person, but I encourage you to really think about how you and your family are going to do that. And so this is not meant to be for something for you to do alone. Support is very, very important and support comes in different flavors. You know, sometimes you might need emotional support. Sometimes you might just need informational and educational support. Sometimes you might just need help with the plain old logistics. And so um, I encourage you to you know, take a photo of the screen here and think about which resources you've tapped into and which you haven't yet, and think about if there's any that could be useful for you. While you already uh, might have that device out that can take a photo, I'd also like to throw up a resource slide here of some um, resources that people I've counseled have found helpful. Many of them will be featured throughout the conference as well. Um, but I encourage you to take these uh, at the pace that you need. And I just wanted to say thank you for your attention. And uh, thank you again to the AFTD for giving me the time and space to talk about such an important topic. Um, I hope that you all are getting a lot of meaningful um, content and engagement out of the conference. And I really look forward to taking any questions. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lainey, for your wonderful presentation. I know that Lainey's slides were chocked full of really good information, and so she was kind enough to let us share her slides. So if you actually go to the Swap Card app, um, underneath you're gonna see the slides are available. You can print them out and use them. 
Um, there was just a lot of really good detail there that we wanted to make sure that you guys had access to. So if you have any questions or need anything, please reach out to AFTD or the helpline. Now, Lainey has graciously agreed to join us virtually right now to answer some questions. And one question, Lainey, that came up that was of, you know, it's a common question we hear very often is in regards to, you know, how can genetic counselors help families talk to their children um, and, you know, future generations about the genetic risk? Thanks so much. Let me just confirm. You can hear me okay before I get going? We hear you, Lainey. <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah, so this is a really challenging aspect of the genetic, you know, communicating the potential risk to children, siblings, extended family is not an easy task. And so genetic counselors are able to help in several different ways. Um, one thing that I will do with my patients sometimes is practice. You know, sometimes people can tell me what they think they might say to their loved one uh, to convey the risk, and I can help them figure out what they're comfortable sharing and not. Another thing I always offer to do is schedule a fa follow-up family call. So after people have had the chance to share information with their loved ones, we can always organize like a group session where the family can be together at the same time if they're comfortable with that, and then they can benefit from having their questions answered um, at the same time and, and hearing the questions that others ask that they might not have thought of. Um, another thing is uh, we often provide like a family letter that um, families can use among themselves if they feel that that's helpful in, in communicating information. Um, at the end of the day, there's really no right or wrong way to, to tell the family. It's everyone will approach this at different times and in different ways and it can depend on um, what the family communication structure already looks like in a sort of typical day-to-day -day basis. And so what we really encourage is for people to go at their own pace um, and to do it, uh, the communication when it feels right for them. There's also some really great resources on the AFTD website about talking with kids. And even though the condition is different, a lot of the themes are the same. There's a condition called Huntington's disease, and there's a Huntington's disease youth organization that also has a great tool about how to communicate information with, um, with children. Thank you, Lainey. Mm -hmm. Another big question that's come up is in regards to how can people find genetic counselors who understand FTD and neurodegenerative disease? Yeah, so one of the resources that was listed in the slides, which I hope you'll access and, and pull from, uh, is the Find a Genetic Counselor tool. And on that tool, you can plug in whether you want to see a genetic counselor in person or remotely, what state you're in, as well as what specialty you're looking for. So one of the options is neurogenetics, or um, adult sometimes is listed. And so that can be one way to filter towards genetic counselors that have expertise in this area. Um, another way is if you reach out to the AFTD, you know, they can connect you with me and I can always help find a genetic counselor uh, in your area um, that knows what FTD is. Um, sometimes also you can ask your neurologist if they have a genetic counselor that they work with, they might be able to give you a good referral. Um, and we are also working with the AFTD. There's a group of, of genetic counselors who specialize in ALS and FTD who have banded together and we're working on developing some more resource tools that compile who we are and, and where to find us. So genetic testing really is a personal choice that we um, always want to let people know that it is their decision and they have the right to make whatever decision works for them and their family. Um, but if they choose to pursue genetic testing, what are some of the options available right now for genetic testing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the ways to access genetic testing is through a clinical appointment, through meeting with a genetic counselor, and you can access us through all the ways we just talked about. Um, sometimes neurologists will also feel comfortable ordering genetic testing, depending on their um, experience level and comfort level with genetics. Um, there are also, if it's hard to access a genetic counselor near you, um, there's some remote companies that offer telehealth genetic counseling, and they're licensed in all the states so they can see you from wherever you are. And so that's another way to access testing. There are some clinical trials that right now are offering genetic testing as part of their um, you know, service to the community, whether it's tied directly to the trial or they're offering a sponsored um, testing program. Um, some of those options for genetic testing through trials don't come with genetic counseling. And I really encourage you to seek out, um, you know, counseling as needed. And some of the tests that are offered from these different programs 
aren't the same tests that you would get in clinical care. Sometimes it's a limited set of genes, for example. And also you can access genetic testing through some research studies, but it's very important to find out ahead of time, are these results that will get returned to you as part of a study or not? Because every study varies and sometimes studies offer both options. And um, again, the quality of tests you might get are, can differ as well as what genes that are covered might differ. Um, so it's important to, to really ask those questions of the study team before agreeing to that. So I have a question from the virtual audience, and the question really is talking about um, There was a lot of frustration in the person's life and in the journey after the struggle with the FCD diagnosis, but family members were pressuring them to get genetic testing because they wanted to know if the risk came to them. And, you know, I know this happens very often. Family dynamics play a very um, interesting role in how we handle and care for others. So any recommendation that you have in terms of handling family dynamics or understanding that there are times when the caregiver just doesn't have the bandwidth to even pursue genetic testing? Absolutely. This comes up all the time um, because, uh, you know, if every family has a different dynamic and everybody has a different threshold for what they're willing to take on. And so one workaround that sometimes people will find appealing, not everybody, but some, is there's the option for DNA banking where you can pay a one-time storage fee at a lab that will store your um, DNA sample for at least 50 years. Um, and the benefit of DNA banking is that if the person diagnosed or the family is just not ready to deal with genetic testing right now, but they want to make sure the sample is available in the future so that if at any point in the future they or their loved ones decide they want to test, the sample is there. Um, you know, so this is a sort of workaround that we're, we're preserving the opportunity to test in the future, um, if even if not now. Um, this often is a good option if a care partner says, like, I don't have the bandwidth to do the counseling right now or to think about the testing or to think about having to talk about results with the family or if the loved one says i really just can't bear to know if this is genetic or not but i want to make sure that my family has access to this in the future um, so that is one workaround another is you know you can always have an initial conversation with the genetic counselor get the information and choose not to test for now and that's fine too um, but uh, beyond that, the, the sort of detailed workarounds we can come up with and get creative really are specific to each family's unique situation. So I encourage you to reach out to a genetic counselor to help navigate that. Thank you, Lainey. You have been wonderful. We really appreciate you taking some questions. I encourage the audience that if you have further questions, the helpline is always here to help you. Please reach out. Um, we can answer your questions. The email address and the number to the helpline is all over Swapcard and all over most of your collateral things that you received today. So please reach out. We're happy to answer your questions. At this time, we're going to say goodbye to Lainey and thank you for all your work. And I have the wonderful... <laughs> <laughs> and I have the wonderful opportunity to welcome Deborah Niehoff and her, um, de her group right now. Deborah Niehoff is part of our research department, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about biomarkers. So they're going to come on up here.